uh, and we're hosting tonight this uh, debate event with candidates from Toronto Centre. Um, just to give you a, a quick sense, uh, we, we, d we did expect to have more people here, uh, so apologies to, to everyone that the room isn't, isn't more full, but hopefully people will stream in as we go, but with this amount of people we can also have uh, a lively exchange as well. I'm hoping that everyone has questions in mind because you'll certainly have an opportunity to put them to the candidates. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Um, just quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll go over who we have at the table. Uh, so first we have uh, Ellen Michelson representing the Green Party of Canada. We have uh, Bob Ray, a uh, Liberal candidate for Toronto Centre. Uh, we have Susan Wallace from the NDP and we have Bauman Yazdenfort. Did I get that? Um, yes, that's correct. Bauman Yazdenfort, who's an independent candidate. Um, the way this is going to work is we're going to have three questions that we've already set out and sent to the candidates that are going to start off the debate. So we're going to give each candidate two minutes to respond to each of those questions and then we'll have a few minutes of conversation after that uh, of more sort of open style debate on each of those questions. After that point we're going to move it back into, uh, throw it back to the audience and have uh, people here get a chance to put their questions to the candidates. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is just uh, have each candidate introduce themselves very briefly, one minute if you could, I'm sure there's a lot more to say. but. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to start off with that, and then we're going to jump into the first question, and I'll share that, uh, obviously, before the candidates give their answers. Right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. I'm Ellen Michelson, and I'm the Green Party candidate in Toronto Centre. And I uh, ran uh, in 2008, so this is my second time. I'm not a professional politician. I'm a retired teacher and writer. And uh, I do have extensive international experience, which I think is relevant here. When I retired from teaching, I took a fellowship for 10 months at a place like Boise uh, in Greenland. I have represented Canada as one of almost 500 representatives who were first uh, in, who were part of the first uh, Canada Corps for the Orange Revolution uh, election rerun in Ukraine. And I have also worked with teachers in Guatemala and Nicaragua. And I have spent extended periods in China and have ties to all the other continents but Antarctica. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Ray. Uh, I'm a, I am the I've been, had the good fortune of being elected uh, ten times, I guess, federally and provincially, and most. Uh, so I am, I guess, a, a recovering politician. Uh, I seem to find it hard to give up. Um, I've uh, um, been representing Toronto Centre since 2008 in the by-election, uh, and it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. I've also had the good fortune to be the foreign affairs critic of, uh, of the Liberal Party, uh, and before before that, I spent a great deal of time setting up an international NGO called the Forum of Federations, and I've uh, uh, been very much involved in governance issues around the world, um, and uh, look forward to the discussion. I think it's a, an important question. Uh, I think Engineers Without Borders have done a great job of uh, getting us all to focus on some of these issues, um, and uh, I look forward to a good discussion, although I don't think it will take two hours. <laughs> take a little less than that. I wanted to take a little less than that. <laughs> I'm just warning you in case I could suddenly bolt from the room. <laughs> and my name is Susan Wallace. I'm the NDP candidate for Toronto Centre. And thank you very much for, to the organizers for having us here. And thank you all for taking a Saturday night out of a, a holiday weekend to come down here. It's really appreciated. Um, my international experience comes from a different angle. Uh, for a great number of years, I was the executive director of a union that represents performers in live performing arts called Canadian Actors Equity Association. And it's a union that represents uh, artists working in theater and in dance and in opera. And as such, um, I had the opportunity to meet with international colleagues and do a lot of work on developing an international treaty on, around cultural diversity issues. And that has, has really broadened my own perspective, but that comes from a more UNESCO kind of uh, direction. So when this invitation arrived, it was, uh, it was very interesting, especially the <coughs> questions that were put forward to us because they caused me to 
take time out and go and look at the record and see where we were coming from on this. Uh, because as many of you uh, folks who are students will know, this campaign has actually been focusing on a lot more uh, domestic issues and having to do with, uh, with uh, our economy, with our parliamentary system, and with respect to, to folks in Toronto Centre, really around housing issues and post-secondary education. So this opportunity tonight is one I look forward to, and I thank you again for the opportunity. Good evening, my name is Bahman. Uh, my last name is Yazlan Fad, but uh, Bahman is fine. I am running as an independent candidate in Toronto Centre. Uh, I don't have the background of the party to uh, uh, explain about that uh, to you uh, folks. Uh, the reason I'm attending to this particular meeting is because uh, I spent about seven years in Afghanistan in the very most volatile time. And when I look at the footage on TV and look at the footage on the internet and the other media, I see there is no, not much of a development done there, and yet we are spending so much money on there. The reason I am here just to get in this discussion to see what's happening for money in the foreign development. Great, so thanks, thanks very much to all of you again for taking the time out of a, I'm sure, very busy campaign to, to come and discuss international issues and Canada's role uh, in promoting global development. We're going to start off with our first question. Um, and just uh, a reminder, we're going to ask everyone to, to take two minutes, each candidate to take two minutes, and we're going to go down the line as it is starting with Ellen. The first question um, goes like this. Todd Moss, a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, recently wrote that aid agencies are too often tackling yesterday's problems with an outdated set of tools. If our development policies and agencies are to serve our interests, then we need them to both live in the present and prepare for the future. In your view, what should Canada's development policy look like in a decade from now? Thank you. This question meshes perfectly with the Green Party's approach. Our election platform and our budget go out three years. Our main policy document available on our website greenparty.ca is called Vision Green and offers our long-term green vision for Canada and our role in the world. We need seats. We need your votes and I'm asking you to vote green. Once in Parliament, we can push harder than we already are pushing for a Canadian Department of Peace and for an international development position in Cabinet. As well, we prioritize ending poverty, the surest route to world peace. And we have long pressed for the elimination of all nuclear weapons. Please ask for more details on any of this later, if you wish. Thank you. Um, I, I think that it's important to kind of separate out or tease out some of the very important different elements that need to be part of our aid program. Um, I would like us to be able to say in 10 years time that we've been able to deal with some of the greatest uh, barriers to development. Uh, we've been able to deal with uh, the big diseases that are causing such hardship and such pain and such travail to parts of the world. Uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like us to be able to say that we have taken uh, a targeted number of people out of absolute poverty. I'd like to see us working on the next set of Millennium Development Goals and be able to say, here, are, here is how far we've come in reaching these goals. I'd like to see a greater focus by, in our development efforts on issues of governance and conflict prevention, uh, and obviously peace promotion as part of that. Uh, and I'd also like to see us uh, having a much clearer role with respect to how uh, we intend to advance the economic development of women uh, because I really do believe that that is a critical feature of our development, uh, has to be a critical feature of our development program right, right across uh, the board. Um, I'd like to be able to say that we got to point seven, although uh, to me it's, it's, it's it, I think even more important than point seven is this whole question of accountability and, and results. Are having a clear sense that we're measuring how we're doing and that we can say we, we took we took steps that we started here and we ended up ten years later being at a at a different point in the time and in a different place. 
Uh, and I think that's one of the things we have to keep aiming for is, is really attempting to establish clear criteria by which we measure our success in aid policy and then announcing how it is that we've, we've moved along the continuum, along that process that uh, helps to get us there. If we look, took the Millennium Development Goals, for example, we'd see how well we've done since they were introduced and we could clearly indicate what more we have to do in order to reach the targets that have been set. Because I think the targets are not ones that we invent in Canada, but the targets are ones that are reached by a very profound international consensus. Well, Canada as a, as a half country definitely has a responsibility around the world to, to share its wealth and to do everything that it can to bring peace to the world and to the poor and the vulnerable to provide for food security, women's equality, and ensuring environmental sustainability, uh, as well as addressing uh, the AIDS at, at pandemic. So what would it look like in 10 years if, if we take account of the fact that the NDP in particular is not particularly happy with where we're standing right now, 10 years might be a little bit short to accomplish our goals, but Keeping that in mind, we would, we would address a threefold strategy. One around aid, obviously bringing, up, bringing ourselves up to the 0.7 of GDP right now, including an immediate $500 million infusion into our foreign aid budget. Uh, but also, in the lead up to the G20, our party released a comprehensive maternal health, child health, health care initiative and uh, medical initiative. And the second thing we would also want to focus on uh, promoting corporate social responsibility. And we supported Bill C-300 in the House. Uh, we were behind that bill, unfortunately. There was a bit of a confusion around where the Liberal Party stood around that, but we'd like to see that. And so that we have the ability to, for our foreign uh, companies in international mining to, to find the most egregious violators. And lastly, we'd like to refocus on peacekeeping and restore the reputation of Canada in the world. Uh, when I look at the whole issue of development, I realize that there is a big problem we have here. And the problem is the mixture of the development policy and foreign policy. In 10 years, first of all, I, I like to see within next two or three years, these two policies to be separated from each other. So there is no interference of the foreign policy over the development policy. Second, I like to see that to be treated as a business. It has to be a vision, a picture with a specific goals and a specific goals that can be achieved a stage by a stage and we have to walk back. We should know 10 years from now what we want to see in every single communities and then walk back what we has to be done and keep the people who are in charge of those projects responsible and every step of the uh, uh, project every year, every six months, to look at and see if they did the job, if they achieved to their goal, and then they provide the second step or second phase or following phase of the money. I, at this point, so we're gonna we're gonna open it up and, and have people again have another chance to share some of their <coughs> some of their views. But I wanted to put it back to everyone that I think one of the, the key things that we were trying to sort of draw out with this question is understanding that the rate of change in the world today is is quite dramatic and arguably uh, things are changing faster than they ever have and, and borders and global, global connections are, are increasingly important to a country like Canada as well. What do you think is going to be different about the way that Canada is engaging these issues? What are the, the massive global trends that you think will require Canada to, sh to change footing and to refocus its, its priorities and its approach? to engaging in global development. What, what, are, what are those big ticket issues that you think in the next 10 years Canada needs to get ahead of to ensure that we remain relevant? Do you want to go the other way so that different people have the turn? I would say like, let's kind of do a popcorn uh, style. Like, you know, <laughs> 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 Jump up. Jump up. I mean, to the extent that all politics is local, um, you guys have it in your power to, to vote uh, on May the 2nd or before, if you wish, to change government. And if you want to look at a different long-term picture come five years or ten years, you need, in my view, a different government in Ottawa, one that actually will act on the initiatives and the values that we're expressing to you today. And please take notice of who is not here tonight, please. <laughs> How's that for popcorn? <laughs> I think the hard, the hard thing about that question is, 
we don't really know what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I mean, we can see some trends. <laughs> we can see that unless, but I mean, who knows if there's going to be another major outbreak of an illness or a disease that we haven't identified. Uh, who knows what natural disasters will take place that can set a country back like, uh, like Haiti has been completely set back by virtue of the, the extent. I mean, you know, Haiti, in 10, you know, literally in 30 seconds, 300,000 people were killed. I mean, think about it for a minute. I mean, think about what the impact of that is on a, on a country. Compare what the similar impact would be if such an event were to happen in Canada. I mean, it would, it would mean the death of several million people in 30 seconds. So, I mean, for us to be able to say, you know, we know where we're going to be in 10 years and where Canada should be, and I think that, frankly, I think it's impossible. Uh, I think what we can say is that uh, government, the government has to work better. Uh, we have to have a better sense of what we're trying to accomplish and how we think we can accomplish it. My observation of watching CETA and foreign affairs and defense and trade is that there's not enough coordination. There's a huge problem with the lack of of lack of really, you know, figuring out how we're going to work better together. Uh, and then there's not just the team government, there's the team Canada. There's every NGO that's out there, every organization that's there, that we really have to bring together as part of a, a, a part of a common effort in really assessing where we are and how we think we're contributing to, uh, to advancing the goals that we, I think, pretty well everybody would, uh, would share. But I'm not sure we can tell for sure or know we really have a clue as to, you know, where do we think this is going to go in, in 10 years' time. Except that big countries will be rapidly industrializing. Uh, there will still be deep pockets of poverty in many parts of the world. Uh, environmental um, change and degradation pretty well ensures that there will be major famines and major catastrophes on a fairly regular basis to which we will have to respond as a, as a country and other countries will have to respond. That's pretty well all I can say. Uh, I think that uh, there's something, there's an elephant in the room that uh, nobody has brought up yet and I would disagree with you that we can't predict. I think we can predict. I think climate change is going to have huge impacts. I think there are going to be climate change refugees I think if Canada is not proactive about formulating a plan for this, then uh, we are going to be, we're going to demonstrate continuing uh, ethical negligence. And this is where I believe uh, my party has very much to offer. So this is an important issue that I think we all need to think about. Yeah, I, 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 I said environmental degradation. I mean, I, I, I include, you know, climate change in that. I don't I mean I agree with you. I think, I agree with you one hundred percent what you just said. I think it's absolutely right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt there is uh, life is full of inconsistency and we don't know what's happening one minute from now. But without planning, uh, we cannot even uh, put a guideline for the people that they are doing the job to do what they're supposed to do or what they promised to do. Uh, all of these disasters happening has happened and will happen. The question is, what can the role with this fast growing environment and globalization can do to, uh, uh, to help those people or to those uh, communities that they are in, uh, what is it, they're poorer than us? The, question, the lack of engagement from the government officials with the local people at any country that they are putting the project, that is the problem. The problem is someone, a bureaucrat sits in Ottawa, get a piece of paper, look at the statics, and they say, well, that much for this country, that much for this, and then when they send the envoy to that country, they just sit with the president or vice president or ministry of finance of that country, and they don't go and engage with the public to find out what is the real is needed. If we want to let this uh, present government stay in power, we will have more of the nuts in the documents with the uh, minister on the documents in every project. 
we're going to jump into our second question. I think it builds on that one quite well, in particular around the idea of being able to predict global trends and things that are going to be changing in the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, and puts the emphasis on, on really how Canada is equipped to deal with changing circumstances. So the question is, uh, the foreign aid debate in this country often focuses at high level on the question of how much money is poured into our aid programs. Yet in recent years, Canada's approach to foreign aid has frequently been criticized for its lack of effectiveness. For instance, Canada was recently ranked 21st out of 35 countries in terms of the quality and effectiveness of our foreign aid. What are the specific policies, and I would, I would accent that word specific, um, <coughs> that your party would put in place to increase the value and overall impact of our four and a half billion dollars worth of foreign aid? Want me to start again? Okay. Uh, the 0.7 percent target has been around for a while. For half a century, Canada has been claiming enthusiasm for ODA and not delivering effectively. Our most recent government is not the only one lacking. The Chrétien statistical increases in ODA followed only after and were based on that government's draconian cutbacks. The 4.5 billion of ODA noted in the question is in fact only about half of what 0.7% of our GDP would total. It is ironic that ODA also spells someone's name. <laughs> the ODA debacle <laughs> indicates the general issue that development <laughs> development priorities have been blatantly politicized and or subsumed under international trade priorities. The Green Party believes in small and local, not one size fits all. We have specific policies and plans based on our ties with communities in Canada and with international Greens. Uh, what comes to mind right now, some of our policies, I can talk about Iran, I can talk about Afghanistan, I can talk about Haiti, um, and I can talk about the Middle East and Libya. And so please uh, ask me what will work best according to the green planks of, for specific countries, and I will do my best to answer. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's perhaps fitting that today, April, 23rd, <laughs> is uh, actually Mr. Pearson's birthday. Uh, so uh, he's, he, it's his report that he wrote at, after his time as Prime Minister for the World Bank that came up with the 0 0.7 number. My own view is that we need to look at the whole thing all over again. I mean, it, it really is, you've got to understand how much the world has changed since that time. Uh, there are two other elements that people never look at in terms of trying to assess what is Canada's foreign assistance effort. Uh, one of them is remittances, that is to say the money that people send back uh, to uh, their home country. So that, for example, the, the, the largest flow of cash into Haiti uh, doesn't come from the Canadian government. It comes from Canadians who are sending money home to their relatives. Uh, and that is true for a great many countries that uh, have do not have great uh, economic circumstances where just routinely, I mean, again, we should all be aware of this, your fellow Canadians, the people that you live next door to, are sending 10% or 15 or 20% or 25% of their income. They're sending it home. Uh, and that is a huge cash flow that's, that's leaving us, it's leaving the United States, leaving the UK, many countries in Europe. It's a huge source of, of economic development that we don't even look at. It doesn't, hardly turns up in economic statistics. It's very hard to actually get a sense of how much it all is. And the second thing is that there's been a growth since Mr. Pearson wrote his report in 1970, a spectacular growth in NGOs. Uh, and NGO growth and NGO wealth and the richness of the international development effort that's led by NGOs was really never anticipated. Talk about what we don't anticipate. It was never really anticipated on the scale to which it has now grown since 1970. 
So my own view is that when it comes to money and assessing how we're doing and assessing what it's, what it's really doing, we have to have a broader sense of just being this government department or that government department. We have to look overall at what the effort is. Some of it's covered by the ODA statistics and some of it isn't. I don't say this in order to dress up the number, to say let's, you know, we're, we're getting closer to 0.7 than we think we are. But I think because we, you know, there shouldn't be any sacred cows in this discussion. We should all be saying how do we actually think we're doing, what more could we do, and where is our effort falling short? And that doesn't just apply to us, it also applies to, to others. So I, you know, one, one clear thing that I would change is we have to do a better job of assessing exactly uh, what we're doing and what are the results of what we're doing. Uh, and I think this is a huge problem for government. Government is great, and CETA particularly. CETA is process obsessed. They're obsessed with process, and that is, is a problem, because rather than being obsessed with process, one should be much more interested in, well, what is the outcome of this? And how does that outcome compare to where we were three or five or seven or 10 years ago? I'm sorry to be so annoyed, annoyed with process. You're not annoyed. Um, I'm talking to you. Two minutes. You want to do that here? Well, just to pick up on, on uh, what Mr. Ray was saying, the NDP foreign affairs oh, critic, Paul Dewar, Paul. Paul. <laughs> Relaxed here. Um, presented a precedent setting motion uh, in the foreign affairs committee to establish such a panel of experts that would be actually tasked with a, that kind of review. Uh, to take account of the changing ground that, uh, that we're looking at right now. But in terms of specifics and getting back to the question itself, what are some specific things that could move us forward? I would like to point to the recent um, Bill C-393, uh, which was the drug that, uh, the, the bill that would have provided for ready air access to AIDS drugs uh, around the world. And that bill passed in the House of Commons and was headed up to the Senate, where unfortunately it, uh, it came to a grinding stop because the election was called, but even prior to the election, well, the House following, let's say, even prior to that, though, we had a government in, um, that was using its staff Senate to try to get that bill killed by the Senate. So, but that's a specific bill that we could definitely, um, definitely move us forward. We've talked a little bit about promoting corporate social responsibility, but then I want to then wind it up in terms of specifics. Back to the money. And one of the things that we haven't talked about is the choices our government makes with the money that they allocate. And if we want to see that pie made bigger for foreign aid, we have to find elsewhere to get it from. And one of the most obvious places we can get it is from withdrawing from military initiatives such as that in Afghanistan and converting those funds into foreign aid. And that is something that is immediate and concrete instead of the billions of dollars that have gone into a military initiative that money is available to make the pie bigger. Uh, <clears throat> from my perspective, the way that is being done right now is like someone sitting in Ottawa and a spray and pray, <laughs> hoping that something picks up and then say, hmm, we did that. 4.5 or 0.4.7 billion is plenty of money. And it reminds me of uh, when I was a very young man, 18, 19 years old, I saw an Indian movie, Ruti, Ruti Kapoor Makan the basic necessity of the human being is food, shelter, and health. And if they focus just the money on those initiatives, then they can build communities, and the communities will take their life of their own, and then help to the foreign aid, hand to hand to work together. I think the money is being wasted uh, on, on the way. It's like, a, it reminds me of another uh, issue, like uh, that Russian dolls. Uh, from Ottawa is a big doll, and by the time it gets to the people, it becomes very small. Hmm. What do you What do you th all think is the is the appetite in the country to put forth um, policies that would, in fact, very practically address the issue of quality? Uh, Mr. Ray mentioned the the idea of, of really needing to look at, at results and what results are being produced. What are some of the things? that you as candidates and representatives of your party or, or as an independent think uh, would, would be required to move that conversation forward, to really put into practice effective aid and effective aid management? I, I, would, I would put it another way around. I would say that unless we improve dramatically people's sense out there that, that we are succeeding at, at dealing with certain problems as a result of how much we're spending, <clears throat> 
there is absolutely no appetite in the Canadian public to spend another four and a half billion dollars on foreign assistance. I mean, this is why we have to get real here. I mean, if you knock on the door and say, uh, we would like to spend another four and a half billion dollars of your money on foreign assistance, but we're not quite sure what we're going to do with it. Uh, no one's going to no one's going to say that's a great idea. That's why this this debate has to focus on how do we develop a conversation around what we're doing and how successful <coughs> either we are being or not being. And then you can say this is why we need to spend another half a billion a year or whatever number it is. We're not going to get the four and a half right away anyway. It's going to be done over five ten years. But you, there is a crisis here of accountability and of transparency that we're, nobody's really talking about. And that's why this 0.7 number becomes an icon. But in order for it to become real, we have to do a much better job of telling people what the heck we're doing. Yes, I think that uh, Canadians, when they hear, let's spend more money, let's spend more money someplace else, are not interested. But when we hear specifics and commitments to accountability, then we become very interested. Canadians care. Uh, if we hear specifics about uh, HIV medication, if we hear specifics about climate change amelioration, if we hear specifics about the needs uh, and the impact of addressing the needs of women and families, uh, Canadians will be interested. And we want to see, we're finding, we're tired, all of us, I think, in this room are tired of the lack of accountability and the lack of follow-through and this is why I think the uh, Foreign Assistance Reform Network specific proposals are very very worthwhile and and my party supports them and I think they really need uh, to get wider currency. What are some of the, I think that everyone here would agree that Canadians are giving people that we care and we're engaged in international issues Yet, an interesting trend to look at as well is the growth of the NGO sector and civil society. And, and to an extent, and I would say this as a young person as well, that people are, are trying to, to, to go around governments. So Absolutely. Um, so how do, you, how do you... Well, I just want to pick up on that because having worked in an NGO, albeit in the cultural sector for a great number of years, I can tell you that um, for every dollar that you apply for from a funding body, it used to take you know X number of hours of a staff person's time to apply for that one dollar. And what has happened over the past number of years is that the money from public funding bodies has gone down, and that's not just in the arts, it's in everything, for every NGO. But the hours and hours and hours it takes to apply for that money have gone up and up and up. And so the administrations of NGOs have grown. And there are now, in fact, graduate school places you can go for NGO administration to learn how to fill in a grant application, make sure that you hit all the key buzzwords. I mean, this is sounding familiar, I'm sure a lot of you who are making grant applications so that is the kind of thing that when you talk about you know, buzzwords like transparency and accountability, we also have to make sure that we don't fall into administrative red tape traps. We mean true accountability, true delivery of aid, not just what a form tells us is what we're looking for. We're looking for a mechanism to deliver aid internationally that achieves results that we as Canadians want and when we give our money as we so generously do, we know that we're going to get those results and not to have it bogged down into what can be, with a view to transparency, just a real trap in, in administration and bureaucracy. From perspective of the public, we don't have any shortage of the desire. What we have is shortage of motivation, and that uh, fueled by lack of trust. Lack of trust to the administration that uh, whether or not they can handle the money properly. Uh, it's like a boy who used to cry wolf. Every time they come and say, oh, we are going to help, and then we see no, no result, then we say, why should we let them to add more to that money or to that fund? If you get engage with the people in Toronto area, in GTA, we have about 47% of the public are ethnic population, and every one of them cares about someone back home for him or his or her uh, family. So they are willing to help and engage and contribute as much as the government does. But because they see the, the, this, uh, there is a lack of trust to the administration of that money, they don't engage. We're gonna Can I make a comment? 
I'm going to be a stickler, and I'm going to say we're, move, we're going to move on, but I'm sure you can incorporate it. <laughs> um, we're obviously here to talk about development policy, and to think of development policy in the true sense of the word, we need to think beyond aid policy. So the question is, uh, while aid policy is an important part of promoting global development, it's still a relatively small part of that venture. To give you an example, private capital flows into Africa reached $55 billion last year, almost double the amount of global foreign aid. That's a 77% increase from 2005. How do you think Canada's non-aid policies, such as trade, investment, and migration policies, could be enhanced to help promote global development? We're going to keep having restart. One example of this problem is the sorry history of Bill C-300 for corporate accountability for mining oil and gas activities in developing nations. Even though it was introduced by his party, my colleague here abstained on the April 22, 2009 vote. Had ethics and responsibility been of enough consequence for all the parties already in Parliament, this bill would have passed. Needless to say, we supported it. Canada needs Greens in <coughs> Parliament. Four more green issues, mining. We oppose asbestos and uranium mining in Canada. Greens are also concerned about the free trade agreements already on the books and those in the works. As well, we advocate a tiny international financial transaction tax called the Tobin tax, and we would like to explore the possibility of extending a similar fee for commodity speculation especially in these times of rising food prices and directing funds so raised to overseas development. And we have strong refugee policies. Again, please ask for details. The, just to be complete, you should say, if you're going to attack me for missing one vote, which I did uh, on second reading, I did vote in favor of the bill on third reading when it came up for the vote, when it, was, when, when it, went, when it went through. So, you know, that's fine. Okay. No, fair enough. <coughs> Um, the, well, first of all, look, I mean, in Canada, we look at development. Development doesn't come from the government. It comes from uh, an economy. So the, the purpose of what we're trying to do in every society is encourage these, econ these economies to become functioning and to become, become working, uh, working economies which will produce jobs and produce wealth and, and then to have the kind of policies that will make sure that the way we produce wealth is sustainable and also that if there's a there's a commitment to social justice that goes along with it. You need to have all those elements together uh, for a society to be successful. You don't want to have uh, a society in which there's no economic development or the thought that all the assistance is going to come from the government. Uh, so yeah, I mean, how, the ca how, the, how private capital is flowing is very important, but also what are the mechanisms in, in, in governance in those countries that allow them to, to uh, develop uh, uh, corporate social responsibility within those countries. Yes, there will be, I think, a greater international pressure growing in the UN and elsewhere for much greater corporate accountability for how people are investing and, and what the impact of that investment is. But the other key element is we have to build up the capacity of governments uh, to deal with the, the impact of economic uh, development. That's an absolutely critical uh, feature, has to be a critical feature of our aid policy. Um, I do think this comes back to my point, is that when we look at development, we have to kind of break through the bubble of just looking at one little thing, ODA, and say that's what it's all about, and say no, it's got to be broader, we've got to understand what everybody's doing in order to see how effective uh, we are in creating growth. Some countries have been able to grow very effectively, Bangladesh, for example, has come out of absolute abject poverty to a situation where economic development is actually happen. Still a lot of poverty, but much less than there was before. Well, I just want to touch a little bit back on what Ellen was saying about Bill C-300, and <coughs> thanks for clarifying that you made the vote, but the reality is Mr. Agnastic missed the vote. And so, you know, uh, that it's what Hansard said. It was. He was not there for the vote on Bill C-300, and Bill C-300, the Corporate, uh, Social, uh, the Corporate Accountability Act, was, was in fact a liberal initiative, and yet there was a weird 
end game that played out so that the bill didn't go anywhere. So that was very disturbing, and I agree uh, with my colleague on that. <clears throat> in terms of what non-aid policies, like such as trade and investment and migration policies, can be enhanced, uh, trade and investment, the NDP believes in fair trade, not free trade. And, and to that extent, what I mean is that when it, when it comes to negotiating free trade agreements with countries like Colombia, we really think that you've got to take a, a hard look first at what the situation is on the ground, particularly when it comes to human rights. And the record in Colombia is not very clear that, that it is a, a, a good one. There is ongoing persecution of labor leaders, the, the labor environment there and the fight against unions by the government where our Canadian mining companies would actually be doing business were they to be there under a free trade agreement. I mean, we've got to be very clear that human rights trumps all and, and that we're not about to enter into a free trade agreement and do business uh, with a company and sustain their government when they have a, a, a shoddy human rights record. So that's something that we've got to be very, very clear about. We are currently negotiating a free trade agreement with, uh, with uh, the European Union. And again, this is being done by our current government under a cloak of secrecy. We're, we're talking about things that should be up and open and, and debatable uh, by Canadians and in our Parliament. And before we enter into an agreement that may or may not uh, be good for us on a win-win for jobs, uh, will it raise our Canadian standard of living? Will it respect the environment? We don't know any of those things yet because these discussions are happening um, under a cloak of darkness. And with respect to migration, just very quickly, uh, it, it's absolutely true that we have to have an efficient, transparent, and accountable immigration system. We have to reduce our reliance on, on um, short-term job uh, foreign workers. Thanks. Uh, from my perspective, again, uh, the issue is the uh, allocation of the funds. For instance, in Afghanistan, we are spending $1.5 billion a year for the war, for the military. And uh, beside two billion that we put infrastructure for the Canadian uh, uh, station over there. So in the last 10 years, it's about 15 billion and more or less about 20 billion total. And yet, 80% of the Afghans who are farmers, we didn't do anything to help them to farm. And then we talk about the trade. If we don't if we, if we don't create that kind of the multilateral trade with the countries that we are trying to help, then there is a disparity between these countries, and therefore we more and more we try to put more money in, on the security and army. The benefit of the trade with those countries in need is they, we make them more self-sufficient, and therefore we reduce some of the budget from our security and allocate it to the development. Great. Would anyone like to uh, elaborate on what they were saying before? Otherwise, we can jump into <coughs> questions from the audience. I can, Let's go, I can go back to uh, what I wanted to elaborate on previously uh, in terms of efficiency and transparency and uh, uh, for, for uh, helping and working with other countries. And I think that there's a bit of a negative track record with a lot of the long-term parties uh, in terms of increasing bureaucracy. Uh, and I think that needs to be looked at very carefully. And then there was another point that I wanted to make in terms of my own personal experience involved with this foreign aid. I think another thing that is not often looked at is that governments agree that this government is going to give that much money to that government for a particular project. And uh, at this level, the government is very happy to get a bunch of money from this government. But the people here who actually end up implementing the decisions that were made here already have professional and personal lives. And all of a sudden, they find that more obligations, more professional obligations, more community obligations have been imposed upon them by the powers that be. And I think we need to be very, very careful to make sure that foreign aid does not do the damage that it sometimes does. And this is why this, this 
foreign uh, proposal, I think, and the specific details of accountability are so worth looking at. Thank you. Does anybody else want to touch on that, that existing question that we were working with, or do you want to just jump into That's a good question. That's, 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 yeah. um, so the way we're going to do this is, uh, if you have a question, you can stand up and you can ask a question. Um, I would ask, <laughs> well I know these things are confusing to me. Um, please ask a question and, and, don't, and don't have a monologue or make great commentary. Um, please sort of make sure that you do get to a question. So does anybody have a question for the candidates? What is your party or your own policy on agricultural subsidies? Uh, I think it would be great if we lived in a world where there were there were uh, there were none. The problem we face as a country is that we're competing in a world where a great many other units have them. The U.S., for example, has massive agricultural subsidies. Europe has huge agricultural subsidies. Um, and the problem that we face is that unless un unless we we we, we match or deal with that problem, uh, we're faced, we, we basically are abandoning our farmers to a world which is not a, which is not a free trade world in terms of uh, ending subsidy. I think the particular issue that we face uh, with developing countries is that we're not being aggressive enough in encouraging the flow of their products into, uh, into Canada. Uh, and uh, I guess a modest defense I would make as a part of a longer debate about a free trade agreement with the number of countries that are being signed right now. I mean, I'm a multilateral trader. I'd much rather have multilateral agreements than one-off agreements. But one of the advantages, for example, of some of what we're doing is that it does give access <coughs> to, um, to products from Colombia or Panama or wherever we're signing the agreements, and that allows them to come into Canada free of tariff. And I think, that's, I think that is a significant advantage to the agricultural producers in those, in those countries. Well, I'm from Saskatchewan, so I grew up around the wheat board, and uh, so I know <laughs> quite a bit about, about uh, subsidies, particularly for, for grain. And clearly, our uh, our Western farmers are deeply dependent on subsidy uh, for for keeping for being able to market Canadian grain, and it's something that the NDP does support in terms of protecting our, our domestic uh, farming community. Taking it down a notch, though, where it'd be interesting to go in terms of agricultural subsidies is more local, is to have um, some form of further incentive to maintain the family farm, for example, so that more and more of us could afford to eat healthy and local. And right now, eating local is sometimes out of reach of the average Canadian because it's very costly. And I would much rather buy a local tomato than one, frankly, grown in Colombia and shipped uh, in a shipping container, causing an enormous ecological footprint. Uh, so, you know, the downside to what, what Ms. Ray, Bob, is talking about is that, uh, you know, yeah, I love strawberries in January. Should I eat a strawberry in January? Not so sure, because the consequences in other areas are just a bit too dire for me. Okay, um, this is a wonderful question, because it gives me a chance to bring this to your attention. Uh, our main, main policy document that I mentioned earlier, Vision Green, is about 125 pages long. You can download it from greenparty.ca and you can search it on terms that are of interest. It has an excellent table of contents, very detailed. Uh, this is our platform and that's also on our website. It's very short. The first few pages are a very quick read and what I'd like to emphasize is the last two pages which are a budget. I mentioned it earlier. And uh, the line items on the budget are very, very interesting because it's fully costed. Anything we spend, we show directly where we're going to find the money. And we have quite a bit of innovative concepts that we're putting forward. And two specific things that are relevant to what you've asked is that we will save a ton of money by stopping federally funded GMO research. And we will plow some of that money into transitioning to organic farming. I think that Susan is right, uh, that we want to shop local, we want to foster local community um, and family farms. Certainly the Green Party uh, is, has long been in favor of that. And people in cities, and most of us are, are urban dwellers in Canada, 
um, there's more and more desire for organic uh, products and produce. And uh, it's not readily available. This is what people want, and this can we can have this, and this is what we're going to try to encourage. Carmen? Subsidy, the issue of the subsidy has two aspects to that. One is the human element of that, which is farm. Another one is the business element, which is government. That has to compete with other, company, other countries as well. When we are talking about local shopping and local food and local produce, then uh, it's not the issue of the just demand. Those local farmers are, uh, what is that, marginalized when it comes to the subsidy, and subsidy just allocated to the specific industry, a specific part of the agriculture, and the specific uh, uh, farmers in a specific provinces. That has to be addressed by whoever is in charge to, find, uh, to focus and allocate part of that subsidy to the local farmers as well. We're going to take another question. So, Amr, I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, so, we discussed a lot about kind of what changes are needed in foreign aid, and I kind of saw like a lot of ideas come out of all of you. Um, but I'm more interested in uh, like how consistent we are with our foreign aid. So, in the past 10 years, CETA has changed focuses five times. We've changed focus countries, we've changed sector areas. Um, so, how can we actually focus on development if we are kind of you know throwing away all our knowledge base? Like, we're focusing for two years on one country and all the knowledge we accumulate is then wasted, then we focus on another one. So how does your party want to change CETA in a way that we're picking up the pieces rather than just wiping the slate clean? I think that's a great question. One of the, this is one of the areas of public policy that's been more subject to, to fads of various kinds than almost any other one can imagine. So your description of it is absolutely right. And I think one of the tough jobs is going to be with a new government is saying, okay, let's not throw out what we've just done over the last four years. Let's see how we can build on, on it and broaden it. So, for example, I would say, you know, with Mr. Uh, you know, Glenn Pearson, who's our, our foreign aid critic, has said, and Mr. Gnadiev has said, we've got to get back to Africa. We've got to, we've got to do more in Africa than we've done before. And this is after Mr. Harper has said we're trying to shift the focus of our policy away from Africa towards the Americas. I don't think we should abandon the Americas. I don't think we should say, well, that's, we're not going to go there. I think we have to see, frankly, what's good in some of the things that have been done, because some of the things that have been done are not, are not bad. They're quite sensible. But they've been done in abandoning other things that needed to be continued. And plus, there's this overlay of kind of ideological testing. So Planned Parenthood doesn't get it. Kairos doesn't get it. Other NGOs don't get it. And you've got this mess of rights and democracy which is not a CETA-based organization, but which is supposed to be funded by Parliament and has been highly, highly politicized in its treatment. I'd like to see us take a less political approach, if you like, less partisan approach, and really try to build on some of the elements that are good. <clears throat> One thing, for example, that CETA has stopped doing, and that foreign affairs really hasn't been able to fill in, is CETA says to me, when I ask about a question about some funding, they say, well, we're not doing governance anymore. You know, at one point there was millions of dollars for governance in country after country, and then all of a sudden they said, sorry, we're not doing that anymore. You sort of say, well, who in government is doing it? We well, don't know, it's not our job. We're, somebody else should do it. So there just has to be really great consistency. The other big bugbear that I have is there's not enough coordination between what foreign affairs is doing, what trade is doing, and what CETA is doing, and what national defense is doing. You have to bring these silos together and really understand that our overall approach to foreign assistance and, and foreign policy goes together. Foreign assistance is not a separate world from the world of foreign policy. And we've got to get away from this notion that these things are not connected and interrelated. Well, except to the extent that foreign policy, if I could just pick up on that, um, is not something that I think the average Canadian would want the government to hold at arm's length, whereas maybe the delivery of foreign aid might be something that we would like to see delivered with more at, at a more arm's length distance. And so the trick I would then say would be to develop a mechanism where we could all be assured of transparency and accountability, and we'll get back to that, but that we, we not have the same level of political winds affecting Every time we get a new government, oh, we're going from Africa, we're going to South America now, whoops, okay, we're back, we're going back to Africa. 
you know, who? How do you, how do you do that? Well, it seems to me that we have some highly educated and trained people like yourselves in, uh, soon, I'm sure, who are going to. We're going to be looking to you to make these decisions for us, and you should be empowered as professionals to make them. And I'm coming from an NGO perspective here. I think that once we've got the, the grant, we develop the program, we account to you for what we've delivered. But to remove as much as possible the, the, the political uh, motivation, because these are things that need to be developed over years, and to turn on a dime just harms people. As uh, you know, on the ground folks in Africa knew when overnight funding was withdrawn with no explanation, no warning, and no, not so much as a buy your leave. Like, that's just not appropriate. Well, in uh, 2005, Mr. Martin promised for the seat of 25 countries. As soon as one year later, when the conservatives came, they cut a file, 20, become 20. And out of the 20, we don't know who decided which file has to be cut off this deal, and we don't know what was the criteria. As Mr. Ba uh, Ray or Bob says, the, I'm just going to get confused. I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I have to become friend first. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what, I, what I found that uh, there is no consistency. For instance, uh, Bob mentioned about governance. They say they are not involved in the governance, but they spend about 36, $360 million for the political uh, uh, referendum in Afghanistan, which was a shame at the end. So really, there is a wishy-washy, as I earlier mentioned, is just a policy of this play and pray to find out which one hits the target. Yes, oh yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to uh, thank Bob for uh, reading Vision Green, because a lot of what he said comes straight out of Vision Green. Uh, no, no, particularly they, the, they, the uh, they silos took it, they took point. It. They took it from me. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the consistency is important, but we also need to be careful that consistency doesn't bog us down in um, continuing things that, that um, are ready for change. And I think, again, um, Having shared the various platforms in the last uh, week or so with these with these colleagues of mine, uh, if nothing else, they're going to learn the six green values. Um, we have uh, Green Party shares these values with with Green Parties all over the world, and these are our principles, and this is what we derive our policies from, and this is where we find our consistency uh, while we move into change. Uh, and they are ecological wisdom and sustainability, and social justice and respect for diversity, and participatory democracy and nonviolence. And I think if you take those and you build your policies on those principles, then you can find your consistency and yet um, move toward change uh, as needed and as appropriate. Could I throw a, a question back to, to the candidates that tags on to something that was said? Uh, part of what I heard was this idea of uh, perhaps you know, putting, putting aid policy at arm's length um, and, and also to, to, to try and decrease the potential for politicization of the issues. How, how do you think, um, because from, from what I've been able to see in my own experience and, and definitely is demonstrated, in the literature over the last 20, 30 years around the ineffectiveness of Canada's development policies that when you belittle the development policy to other pieces of our, our broader foreign policy, that's part of the reason why it doesn't, it doesn't get taken as seriously as it should. And so how do, you, how do you balance those two pieces around the potential of creating an arm's length capacity versus, in fact, uh, further politicizing it, putting it more into the central, uh, center part of how political decision-making happens. Yeah, it's, like, it's like a normal business. Any business right now, anyone in Canada or any city wants to start a business, have a business plan, goes to the bank, get the loan or a, a, a financier, and put the plan straight forward. And as soon as they open that business, they don't mix different departments with each other. If you, do, if you mix the uh, human uh, resources, with the sales and marketing, or sales and marketing with the, uh, 
what is that, uh, for, uh, 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 technology department, it becomes some sort of a wishy-washy situation that your business goes nowhere. You can have one czar, as you call it, uh, to see oversee all of these uh, different departments without interference. And each department is allocated to the specific uh, country, and each country has its own different branches for every uh, project. I don't see why it is so difficult to, uh, not to be politicized unless there is a willingness to do that. Would anybody else like to tackle that? Well, I just can't see how it would serve the interests of the recipients of our foreign aid to further politicize that process because given the reality right now in our country where we're looking at a series of minority governments, you could foreseeably see that changing every two or three years. And how can you plan for the future if you don't have a steady vision of where you're going? So I don't see how further politicization can, can be the way to go in that, although I mean, convince me otherwise, maybe I'm missing something. But the other thing too is um, when we have our foreign policy being directed from a political point of view, it seems to me just common sense that ideologically there's going to be some inherent unfairnesses in there and that it's not going to be as uh, probably driving what we want it to do. Anyone else on that? We can throw it back out. Yeah, we've talked a lot. I've heard a lot about uh, increasing the amount of foreign aid, and you've uh, alluded to increasing the accountability and transparency of development policy in general. Mr. Yasinfar, um, while I disagree that you think foreign policy and development policy should be separated, and I think you actually need HR to be hiring those people in sales, mm -hmm. um, I think you're onto something with the business idea because we need to we need to introduce innovation. It's not something that we've talked about. But the reason private sector produces something successful is because we have competition and that, that means some ideas are going to fail. So how do we take that idea of competition fostering innovation both in our foreign aid, our development policy, the way we interact with NGOs? I want to, I want each of you to give me a specific example of how to get innovative with development policy. I think it I think it's related to the tension between Keeping aid at arm, like keeping development policy at arm's length, and very politicized because we have to be creative about these problems. Uh, thank you. First, I want to clarify something. When I said HR has to be separate entity than sales and marketing, yes, HR hires that sales and marketing, but you don't want your staff goes around to the HR and have a small petty politics in the office, which we have it in Ottawa right now. Specifically, for instance, I, I can only uh, answer your question from my perspective and my experience. I spent seven years of my life in Afghanistan between 1978 to 1985. During that time, six governments came to the power. And during that seven years, Russians were inside Afghanistan. And then you turn on the TV, they show the soldiers standing hand by hand with the Afghans and putting a couple of the bricks on the wall and they telling to the public, we are here to help them to develop the country. And it was 26 years ago, last I left. Now I am looking at what earlier I mentioned uh, 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 to, uh, I forgot the name. George. I, uh, I, I, I mentioned to George, after 27 years, I look at the uh, footage on TV, after, even though we have 10 years, in the last 10 years, we have 41 nations of the NATO there, I haven't seen anything better than when I left. So, uh, specifically you want to know, allocate that money that you put there, and instead of going and uh, fighting with the insurgent and Taliban, try to put it in the hands of the farmer, help them to farm, help them to build one by one not by the soldier, by the people as NGOs or any other organization who is willing and able to go there and do that. Others on, on the, the question of how we really enhance innovation within the way we do development. People. I can give two specific, I can give two specific examples from our policies uh, in terms I mentioned earlier of how we have tailored them uh, based on uh, commitments within Canada and commitments worldwide. 
Uh, one is in Iran. We, uh, it's easy to list all the many uh, issues that uh, we have with Iran. Uh, one proposal that has come forward within um, our communities in Toronto that we favor is to encourage creating exchange programs, cooperative programs with a range of professionals in Iran to come to Canada to work with, such as engineers um, and other professionals. So that's one specific example uh, that I can offer you. Another specific example for Afghanistan uh, is to support, um, in terms of the farmers, we, we can see a range of farming needs there, but one option is to support poppies for medicine. Uh, people with no money still suffer pain, and uh, this international program that creates uh, legal medication, pain medication, uh, that is made available in many um, of the poorer countries through poppies for medicine is something that we would support in Afghanistan. We feel it's a win-win for Afghanistan and for other countries in need. So those are two, two small examples and very specific. Yeah, I, I would like to, I would allocate money aside every year that would be specifically set aside for, for new ideas and for new approaches and give them five years to work and see if they work and have a very rigorous assessment as to whether or not they're working. I think the poppy one is a good example. That This idea has been around for quite a long time. They, there's a number of NGOs that have proposed it. A lot of them have kind of big comprehensive plans, you know. And the reality is you've got to say, well, let's take, let's take, let's take an area, let's see what we can do. Uh, Turkey very successfully transformed its illegal uh, heroin production into uh, illegal um, uh, narcotic production for pain medication. There's a dramatic shortage of pain medication all over the world, uh, so this may, may be a solution. There are a lot of critics who say it's not a solution, but you know I think we should be able to say, well, let's try this, let's see how it works. And I, I think we do have to set, uh, specifically set money aside that would allow that to happen. Because if you don't let that happen that way, then I think it's just what, and what always happens is that whatever is, is, and just gets more. And that tends to be the, how government works. And that's part of the problem, whether it's a, an NDP government or a liberal government or a conservative government. This is one of the problems of why the public sector has difficulty innovating, because things are just what they are. So if you can set some money aside and say, now I want to try to innovate how we deliver the service, it's not a bad idea to do it, frankly, domestically, as well as in our foreign policy, but it certainly makes a lot of sense for us to try. Well, and I would just add on to, 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 to your question. As I'm understanding it, you're actually coming at this from a governance model perspective. You're looking for a, a different governance model that would allow, actually, perhaps sometimes the option to fail in the same way that any company conducting some R&D knows that it's going to fail 99 times out of 100 before it strikes on the one innovation. And right now, the structure that we're looking at in terms of measurements of foreign aid, it's looking at success or nothing. And if you fail, then you've done a bad thing. And that kind of mindset is, I would like and support change for, because if we are going to allow any kind of creativity in different ways of, of aid delivery to come into it, we have to be allowed to experiment. Sure, we need to have strictures. We're not going to go investing in you know, lotteries. In, <laughs> but within the strictures, experimentation leads to good results and sometimes failures. And we have to learn to live with the fact that failure leads to success. Great. So we're going to take about 15 more minutes of questions. Uh, the gentleman right here. Great. Uh, good evening. I have a question about Libya. I'm wondering uh, what you think the purpose of the NATO mission is in Libya. Is it to uh, protect civilians or remove Gaddafi? And should Canada continue in that mission? if uh, it uh, shifts into uh, removing Gaddafi. Thank you. We uh, oppose um, participation uh, in these NATO missions, and we would favor um, working with the UN instead. And uh, we emphasize um, focusing on diplomatic efforts rather than focusing on um, increasing the conflicts. So I hope that helps. Well, the NDP supported 
the motion parliament to uh, to join the mission. Um, I think, given the circumstances at the time and the date of the vote, when the pleas from the Libyan people were, were so dire, that for me personally, I'll always speak personally on that, I supported that decision. But I, too, am not clear on what the end game is and how we measure success from that. Does it mean he's gone? Does, do we know enough about who we're dealing with on the ground? Um, the situation changing so drastically every day, not just in Libya, but across the region, also begs the question, where do we intervene next? Uh, you know, I mean, Bahrain must be top of the list right now for, uh, so I, I, I too am not clear on what the end game is. Certainly, uh, we do not, the NDP, support regime change. That is not our job in the world, but we do support the protection of, of uh, civilians, in, and, and that was the case when the decision was made. And I'm sure Mr. Ray is gonna fill us in. Mr. Bob is gonna fill us in much more deeply. <laughs> Um, I guess the thing I'd say about Alan's comment is, is look, we, we went into Libya not because of NATO, but because of the UN. It was the UN Security Council said we, there, we do need to protect the civilians in the eastern part of the country. And so we said, well, then we'll establish a no-fly zone. And the, the, in a sense, NATO and other countries, not just NATO, but other countries as well, outside NATO, said, well, let's get together and organize this. And that's, that's what's happened. Um, so it's a little too simple to say we'll do this, we won't do this with NATO, we'll do this with the UN. What do you do when, similarly, I, I mean, not to, I don't want to get into, I mean, happy to get into an argument about Afghanistan, but it's the UN that asked us to stay in Afghanistan and help train the Afghan army and the security forces. I was, I was in Afghanistan when the UN representative in Afghanistan said you can't just leave. Uh, by all means, get out of combat. By all means, you know, decide that your troops are not going to be in Kandahar anymore, but please don't abandon all the efforts that we're making to try to increase the security capacity of the Afghan state. Uh, and it's pretty hard to say that, you know, that we're not, we're just going to tell the UN to go, to go, to, you know, to go, to go. And when Ban Ki-moon <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, we think this is important, you've got to sort of say, well, this, this is important. So, it's, so the lines aren't quite as clear as perhaps some of the rhetoric makes, makes one believe that, that, that they are. Um, and I, also, and I would also say that there are circumstances in which the world could conclude that in fact regime change is necessary in order to protect civilians. Um, we can all think of circumstances in which that in fact is the case, where the treatment of civilians is so terrible that you have no alternative but to try to change the regime. The, the problem is, is that you can't do these things unilaterally. And people say, well, what's the next place? Huge, huge problems in Syria at the moment, huge problems in Bahrain. Um, can the United Nations get itself together to say how a next intervention might or might not happen? But the one thing that has changed in the world, I think we have to appreciate, is that what happens to people inside countries is just as important as what happens to states and to governments. And that's what creates this whole concept of the responsibility to protect. The first responsibility is that of the government itself in the country. So you say to Colonel Gaddafi, you have a responsibility to protect your own citizens. However, when Colonel Gaddafi says, we're going to destroy anybody who gets in our way, there are going to be rivers of blood, and we're going to wipe people out, you sort of have to say, well, he's failed that test. You know, that, he hasn't gotten over that hurdle. So that's why we have to put in the no-fly zone. Um, I, I, I personally would have to say that I will not be unhappy the day when Colonel Gaddafi is gone. And yes, there will be lots of elements in the new forces that are to play that I might not be entirely happy with, but I think you've got to say th these are issues that have to be settled by the Libyan people. And it's never an easy situation, but there does have to be at some point, I think, a question of, you know, we are going to have to intervene. And when the UN says we are going to intervene, I, I voted for the. I voted. I was there. I voted for the motion. I spoke in favor of the motion, uh, and I would and I would do so again, not being entirely sure what the end game might be. Except I don't think the status quo is is tenable. At some point, there will be a, a some kind of political resolution of the conflict. Uh, I have a different take on that. Uh, Mr. Gaddafi is there for the last 41 years. 
in 2004, when he decided to get cozy with the West, we had Mr. Martin, who was breaking the bread in his tent uh, in Tripoli, or Sorelli of Tripoli. And within two years, he had about a contract with about, worth about $300 million, or I guess, if I'm not mistaken, it was Petro-Canada. And then after that, uh, other companies moved in. I don't think it is the game of the people, because even last week, Mrs. Clinton public is, publicly said that he, she is start to know the nature of the rebels. So they are helping to the people that they don't know what is their intentions are, or what is the end game is. When I look at the whole scenario in that area right now, for me is a flashback of the Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, Iraq, between 1978 to 1981. You can check your young fools, you probably don't remember. All of the governments changed during that three years in the region. And then we start with the Tunisia. We went, they went to the uh, Cairo or Egypt, Libya, uh, Yemen, Syria started to do that, and Bahrain as well. So what I'm seeing right now, the end game is just, from my perspective, it's personal uh, opinion, is they are just uh, putting their own people over there. Who, I don't know, but there is a big change in the northern, uh, uh, northern part of the Africa and part of the Middle East, and probably, I can guess, it's mainly because of the competition with the Chinese contract which is uh, they are dominating in the last 10 or 15 years in African countries. In fact, Chinese have 49, uh, they have contract uh, uh, treaties with the 49 countries in Africa. More questions? I had a question for the member of parliament, Bob Ray. So, sir, in terms of restoring Canada's leadership, you have your brochure, what bills would you put forward in, if you were to be re-elected uh, to the House in terms of restoring Canada's leadership? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I would hope very much, and, and uh, I'm still campaigning very actively to see that uh, that we have a new government on May the 2nd. Um, as much as I respect a lot of the private members' bills that are put forward, uh, we have to understand this, this private members' bills are, are, not, are not what a government, uh, are, are kind of removed from implementation. And as long as the Senate has a majority of conservatives, all the private members' bills in the world are not going to get us to where we need to get to. And people, I think, have to understand that. Um, I think the first, key, the first key thing, I think, is for, for Canada to say again that the prevention of conflict around the world and the reduction of violence around the world is, is, a, is now, once again, a cornerstone of Canadian foreign policy. Secondly, I think we have to say very clearly that uh, what Canadian actors do, that is to say Canadian companies, uh, as well as uh, NGOs, everybody else, uh, reflects on the country. So there does need to be a notion of social responsibility that applies to corporations and everyone else. And I think we have to, I think we have to bring that back as a as a concept and make sure that it's implemented in legislation. Uh, and I'd like to see that happen. I do want to see us bring forward legislation that would deal with the question of accountability of, of CETA and foreign affairs and everyone else for the implementation of these policies. I would certainly sign the International Agreement on Transparency and Accountability that's one of the keystones of uh, Foreign's uh, approach. I think that's something that, uh, that has to be done. Um, I mean, those are a few of the things that I would want us to do uh, right off the bat. And, I, and in particular, I guess I have a personal interest. I, I would like to see Canada playing, again, a more constructive role in the Middle East. Uh, and I'd like to see us uh, put that a little higher up in terms of our overall approach into, because I do think it's a critical area uh, for uh, the lowering the temperature around the world is to be able to affect uh, more progress in that area. And even though it's difficult, I still think we should be seen to be trying to do it. Gentleman Green Chair. Uh, excuse me. Can we reply to that response as well? I mean, Canadians going to the polls do have a choice. Sure, right? absolutely. <laughs> <Still>. Great. <laughs> Well, thank you, because I wanted to address the question, because, uh, you know, on May the 2nd or at the advanced polls, you are going to be making a choice, and, and 
the direction that Canada takes with respect to foreign policy is a, is a big factor in many people's decision. And so you should know what all the parties are offering, not just the, the ones here or the ones not here as well. Um, I actually want to talk uh, about the first point that Mr. Ray made about, uh, about our focus on peace and bringing peace to the world and also then point to the record uh, in Parliament of both the Conservative and the Liberal in terms of our participation in Afghanistan. And I just can't say this over and over again uh, often enough because we've got to actually vote into Parliament people who will not only say one thing but do that thing. And it's not good enough for Canadians any longer to have a campaign going on with politicians who say one thing and do the other. And with respect to Afghanistan in specifically, we, we are seeing now a focus on, on campaigning around peace issues when we've also seen support for the Conservative to extend the mission. And, uh, and Mr. Ray, in fact, being quoted, and tell me you've been misquoted, but who, musing that perhaps even the decision to extend the military mission did not require, or to extend the, the mission in Afghanistan did not require a vote <coughs> in the House of Commons. And that's something that I just think is really untenable and the Canadians should know about when they make their choice. And in terms of specifics, I mean, we'd really like to see Bill C-300 get back in there. We do need corporate international responsibility for our mining and oil and gas companies. That's essential, especially if we're going to be doing multi-billion dollars worth of business. We need to know that those companies are respecting human rights on the ground when they are carrying the Canadian flag on the backpack of their Canadian workers down there. We need Bill C-393. We've got to get HIV drugs to the world. We have the ability, we're sitting on, on, on record, uh, record requests and only one company from one request has actually ever gotten any drugs out to the world. So that's got to change. So those are the kinds of, of specifics that the NDP would bring forward if elected in government. Eleanor Bowman, would you like to address that question? Yeah. I'm concerned um, about some of the things that have been said. Uh, it's interesting that there are some liberal policies uh, that the Green Party agrees with, and there are also some NDP policies that the Green Party agrees with, and then we do have some serious issues, for example, um, with uh, the NDP forever trading off uh, environment and uh, economy um, after elections, whereas during elections uh, they talk a great deal about the environment. And I'm also wondering, um, with Bill C-300, did all the NDP members of Parliament vote in favor of it? I honestly, I can't answer that. Because I think that they did not, and it was a very close vote, and uh, I wonder whether it would have passed had there been more support. So that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that um, I think across the board, with the exception of the party that is missing, which was quite consistent. Um, so, so I do um, believe that uh, we need uh, some different approaches here. Great. We're actually we're gonna we're gonna take one more question um, before we wrap up for the evening. So. Uh, is there anyone with a, with a final question? <laughs> so actually, kind of in relation to what, to what you guys were just uh, talking about, you, you do all seem to be in fairly good accordance about the kind of things that do need to be done in terms of foreign aid and development. What I would like to know, and I'm sure a lot of people would like to know, is that realistically, if your party were to uh, be elected to government, if you were to have the power to actually enact some of these policies, how much time and effort do you actually realistically expect your party to spend on foreign aid policy and development policy? Well, it's uh, in our um, party, it's significant. I can tell you a little bit about the people who were involved. Uh, my position is on Green Shadow Cabinet, Peace and Security, and uh, we have a very strong candidate in Kingston who is the foreign policy um, uh, person on Green Shadow Cabinet. And uh, we also did have uh, a CETA and foreign development position. And I'll tell you what happened with him because our, our Green Party wants this position. I mentioned this earlier. And he was our candidate in the riding next door, Trinity Spadina. Uh, the candidate who's there right now is Rachel Barney. And his commitment is such that uh, for many decades he has been uh, active personally in Haiti and he reached the point for obvious reasons that he wanted to put more time into his commitment to Haiti and that is why he resigned as candidate and as and having this position 
on Green Shadow Cabinet. So we are going to fill it again, and we have this commitment. We work uh, on a consensus basis. Uh, we have the Shadow Cabinet Google Group, and uh, we um, work out our policies. There are many um, media releases that I have been involved in that have nothing to do with foreign policy. There are many media releases that have been proposed by our human rights um, uh, person on Shadow Cabinet, our human rights advocate, and uh, that it relate to foreign policy. So this is very, very important to us. Uh, if you check the um, media releases over the last year or so and longer for the Green Party on our website, you will see how, what a substantial commitment we have and what depth of knowledge there is. Is that right? I, you know, I, I think that for the, for, certainly for, for Michael and Ignatieff and, and for me and for a, number, for a number of people in the leadership of the party, this is an important issue. It's not the only issue, it's an important issue. And, and when you look at the full dimensions of what we spend on defense, as well as what we spend on trade, as well as what we spend on foreign aid, what we spend, it's, it's about 30 billion out of, a, out of a budget of 240 billion. So it's not the whole budget, but it's certainly a very important part of the budget. And that, I think, gives you a sense of, of its significance. I think you can rest assured that Michael McNaddy has a very keen sense of how important it is for, for Canada's role in the world, and for that to be, to be clearer, and for that to be better done than it is right now, for there to be much greater transparency in terms of how it's done. And I certainly feel the same way, and you know, we'll continue to work on it as if, you know, as as a as a priority. Frankly, whether we win or whether we lose, uh, we will be looking at it as a priority. And, and I, you never know what uh, what's going to happen, but uh, whatever happens, it, 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 I think it's something that Canadians feel strongly about. I mean, we have um, millions of Canadians <coughs> who are engaged in our foreign policy. Uh, as individuals, as members of groups, uh, and I think it's not something which is of little interest to people. It's of great interest, interest to people, and it's something that they have very strong views about. So it's a mistake, I think, to feel that this is a marginal issue or an issue that's not central. I regret that it has not been made a bigger issue in the campaign, because I think it is a serious issue. Um, but, you know, these things happen in election campaigns, you can never quite tell how, how these things will unfold in the course of the debate. But uh, I do think it's an important question. Well, it's not a question that has uh, that has actually failed to garner some attention during the, the uh, this election. Um, I would actually say that Canada and its place in the world has been subject to a considerable amount of discussion, and it does come up frequently. There is a growing sense among uh, Canadians of their lack of of place in the world or their diminished status in the world. It used to be a lofty thing to be a Canadian and it's becoming less and less so uh, in the eyes of the world. So that discussion I think is happening. In terms of the commitment of the party to redressing that and changing course, you see that commitment every day in us standing up in Parliament all the time, speaking out for what we believe in and how that translates into international and foreign policy. So we have, uh, we support the creation of, uh, of a, uh, a foreign aid uh, ministry. We have full-time critics. We intend to elect a larger caucus so that we can make sure that those issues are brought forward on behalf of Canadians and that the ideals and the values of the party, of the New Democrats, get taken into account when it comes to the formulation and implementation of foreign policy in Ottawa. And uh, so we really are intent on presenting a very clear and distinct choice to voters come May 2nd. I can't comment on that. I'm running as a lone wolf. So. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you expect the other parties to do? Uh, well, well, I, I, I expect the other parties, main parties who form the government, pay attention to every detail of every project that, uh, that affects the national security and the name of the Canada in the stage of the world. And the uh, foreign development is, is performance of the Canadian government Outside of the bond, uh, outside of the borders of Canada, and that is important because if you, as an individual, wants to have the uh, carry the Canadian passport and go to Afghanistan, we don't want someone to shoot you. Very simple. Therefore, if either we don't engage, or if we engage, we go all the way. Simple as that. Great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. 
Um, quick context, uh, Engineers Without Borders brought this event together because we did in fact feel that while foreign policy and development issues have had some airtime uh, in the last few weeks and during the course of the election campaign, that they haven't been given uh, the importance uh, that we think they require. Um, knowing how important Canada's international presence will be to our future, our future prosperity, the maintenance of our values, and being able to, be, to have a seat at the table when as things shift and, and, and capacities like the G8 become of less importance uh, and, and, and we see the expansion of, of decision making in the world, Canada is not going to naturally be a big player and so we need to be smart about how we try and engage internationally. So we wanted to give folks here tonight a chance to, to ask questions to the, to the candidates running the internal center and, and very much appreciate all of you taking the time and a very busy schedule to come and, and engage on the issues this evening. So thanks, thanks to the candidates and thank you very much to everybody thank here. You. Thank, thank you. you.